Now this illustration uh, illustrates part four, portable power feeder cables, rated over 2,000 volts nominal in accordance with 400.51. And the code panel just accepted and added this to the uh, to series 400 for more information concerning such a cable. Now, notice you can select from the following the subject matter that you're dealing with. You know, for example, say you wanted to look at Shields 400.45. Well, now, information would be given there about shielding. But you'd also need to uh, review 315.44 as well as 315.60, D is in dog one. And when you look at those three sections and review them carefully, then you get a good handle on to terminate and ground these shields either at one end or both ends and, and so forth. Uh, it's laid out perfectly for you with these new revisions. So uh, uh, keep that in mind that that's what this illustration is illustrating. Now this illustration uh, deals with snap switches with pushed in terminal terminations. And that's basically what the purpose of change is all about to address when uh, you would need to uh, use a snap switch with binding screws or uh, use the push in terminals. Now notice in the illustration, we show you this, we show you the screw binding screws where you bend the uh, conductor into a, a, a loop, 90 degree loop and you uh, terminate it or you use the pushed-in method. Now, the boxed-in information goes on and tells you this, that 15 or 20 amp uh, type snap switches, if not marked, copper or aluminum, uh, shall be used with copper and copper clad only, see, as required in 404.14D1. The second bullet, uh, you know, basically says terminals, uh, this copper aluminum shall be permitted to be used with copper aluminum and copper clad conductors. And again, uh, 404.14D2 uh, addresses this. And in snap switches with pushed in terminals, screwless shall be installed on not greater than 15 amp branch circuits, number 14AW copper, unless marked otherwise. So basically what this is telling you, before you use these pushed in type terminations, be sure that they will take the size conductor that you're using. That's very important and make sure it, it as the copper conductor, aluminum, copper clad or aluminum required to be uh, uh, solid are stranded and that's what this illustration is illustrating to the user of the code with particular sections and standards above in the table that would uh, give you more information if you want to look at them and uh, uh, obtain this information. Now this illustration deals with reconditioned equipment in accordance with 404.16a through d. And this section is mainly dealing with equipment that you cannot recondition. And when you're reading sections of the code to determine what the code allows and does not allow, you need to read the code in this, in this manner. What's allowed, what is not allowed, see. Now in this illustration, basically, all you lighting, dimmer, electronic type switches, you can't, you can't recondition those. People trying to do that and create hazards where the switch won't uh, operate properly, creates dangerous situations. Circuit breakers, you see in 404.16D, no, you can't recondition those. And, and you got people trying to recondition those, like if you have a quad breaker, they'll saw the uh, blades uh, uh, that connect together open so they can push it over the uh, bus bar. Modifications. And they say, well, well, I'm reconditioning it, and it's all I'm doing. So, and they don't want you doing that. They do the same with these knife switches. One of the blades break, and it's not making and breaking like it should, and they'll just take whole fast bars or a piece of copper and put between it. Uh, no. That, and they say, well, I'm reconditioning it. So they want to specify, no, you can't recondition this type of equipment. Once it defaults in some way, you got to replace it if you can't fix it by the manufacturer's specification. And that's what this illustration is illustrating. 
Now this illustration uh, deals with switching closures with doors in accordance with NEC 404.30. Uh, and the main purpose of this change was just to require doors that open with energized exposed parts once the door is opened to have a tool uh, to open these doors. Now that's exactly what you see in the uh, blue text here. Is that a door uh, that has energized components once you open it requires a special tool or tool, excuse me, or some means to restrict the unqualified person and only a qualified person with a tool can gain access. And a qualified person is defined in Article 100. The unqualified person is defined in NFPA 70E, and that's what this illustration is getting over to the user of the NEC. Now, this illustration deals with replacements using a GFCI type receptacle or protection in accordance with 406.4D is in dog 3. And that's basically what the purpose of change is all about. So any of these receptacles that you see here that are required by the NEC to be GFCI protected, if they're regular receptacles and you replace those receptacles, then they should be replaced with a GFCI type receptacle or provide uh, protection with GFCI protection in some manner. And that's what this illustration is all about. It deals with replacement of receptacles with a GFCI. And that's what this illustration is illustrating to the user of the NEC. This illustration deals with ground fault protection of equipment, GFPE. Now notice uh, in the facility that you see to the left, the building, Ground fault protection equipment for de-icing and snow melting equipment in accordance with 406.28 is permitted and it wouldn't be a GFCI, it would be a GFPE protection, see. And if you wanted to have the same type of protection, ground fault protection of equipment for pipelines and vessels, as you see in the illustration, uh, then that would be permitted, see. So this illustration really wants to point out there is a difference in ground fault protection for equipment than GFCI protection for personnel. And that's what this illustration really is illustrating. Now this illustration deals with receptacle face plates, a cover plate with integral light, night light, and uh, maybe even a USB charger. And this addresses such a situation and the use of spring uh, tension type contacts with power receptacle face plates with these accessories. That's, that's mainly the purpose of the change. And you can see at the very top of the illustration the, uh, uh, the title head contacts, spring tension uh, type contacts. And then connected uh, to what? Only brace or alloy terminal screws. And then what rating could they be? Should be rated one watt or less. And in the illustration with the receptacle uh, to the left there, it shows a USB charger. The one to the right shows a night light. And notice it could be a night light and you, uh, uh, say a USB charger with a unit. But you would look at UL 514D as in dog and get a lot more uh, information here. But basically that's what this illustration is illustrating and notice it says uh, also review effective date of January the 1, 2026 per exception to 406.6D. Now uh, that's what this illustration is illustrating to the user of the NEC. Now this illustration deals with bathroom and shower space. In accordance with 406.9C and exceptions. Now the basic rule is, as you see, excuse me, the bathtub here, that you can't uh, hang, say, a, a ceiling fan that would penetrate the eight foot vertical or the three foot horizontal rule. Neither could you put a receptacle or a switch 
inside a shower or bathroom for, uh, space as you see to the left. However, you could, by the exception number four, and install it accordingly to 406.9C exception four. You could put a receptacle there for a smart toilet. You could also go to the exception three to 406.9C and have a hanging light, as you see, with a cord and plug connected uh, attachment cap plugged into a receptacle, as you see illustrated. And then, of course, if you were looking for those uh, receptacles that needed to be GFCI protection, provided C210.8A1. If you were looking for the branch circuit requirements, then look at 210.11C and single receptacles. Uh, look at uh, 21021B1. And all this information is located right there in 406.9C with these exceptions, and that's what this illustration is illustrating to the user of the NEC. Now, this illustration deals with tamper-resistant receptacles, where they're required and not required, in accordance with NEC 406.12, items 1 through 10, or the exception to items 1 through 10. Now, I'm just going to basically take the easy way for you to review the, and find this information. Where they are required, just look at 406.12, items 1 through 10, on page 302 of the NEC. Uh, and then review the exception to 1 through 10, and you would see where they're not required in basically about four places when you review very carefully. Now, uh, this is basically uh, what I would suggest that you do in reviewing this uh, particular change. Now, uh, notice any receptacle over five and a half foot naturally is not re uh, per, uh, an outlet that has to be tamper proof, or an outlet in a lighting fixture that's up, you know, uh, above the readily accessibility rule. No. A single receptacle for a, a single appliance, you know, with it? No. Uh, a duplex for two or more appliances? No. Uh, if you had a duplex, though, for child care, then actually 406.12 item 3 requires that. But see, you can just reference very quickly 506.12, 1 through 10, required. Not required, the exception to 1 through 10. And you got a, a good handle on how this rule is to be applied. And that's what the illustration is really illustrating. Now, in the previous illustration, the exception to uh, items 1 through 10 was uh, identified for you, where you would have an exception where the uh, tamper proof resistant receptacles would not be required. This illustration just shows where they would be required, and that's the main purpose of this change is to get a, uh, to provide an all exclusive list so it'd be easy for you to reference one through 10 and know where tamper proof receptacles have to be installed. Electricians seem to be having a problem of providing uh, tamper-proof resistant receptacles in all locations. So they wanted to give you the, uh, these locations, 1 through 10, and you could say, well, uh, what about uh, dwelling units? Well, item number one shows dwelling units, boat houses, mobile homes, including their attachment and detached garages where electrical power was provided, accessory buildings and common areas, and then we just looked at the item three in the previous illustration with uh, child care uh, facilities. Uh, we looked at that. So uh, it, it, it's very definite. And when I say the previous illustration where we had that item three, that'd be in our illustrated code change book too, see. So uh, this gives you all the locations where tamper proof would be required. And the previous illustration shows you where tamper proof would not be required. So we have a list and outline now for electricians. Now, this illustration deals with replacement panel boards in accordance with 408.9A and B. And, you know, the purpose of the change is uh, 
for the designer or the installer to uh, distinguish between recondition and replacement of panel boards. Now, for example, looking inside this uh, panel board here, all the breakers, circuit breakers, and components have to be capable of interrupting uh, the available short circuit current. And as it, for an example, if you had uh, 10,000 uh, amp rated components and circuit breakers, it didn't basically interrupt anything below 10,000 real easy, see. And then note two uh, says they uh, not listed for the Pacific location under certain conditions. And then the three bullets here identify available fault current is greater than 10,000 amps and complete work should be field labeled. If the available uh, fault current is less than 10,000, the replacement panel board should be identified for the application. Uh, note three just says that the listing markings on the cabinet of the panel board uh, shall be removed if new ones are to be put on so, so that you get the latest identification of interrupting current uh, of the equipment, uh, that it will interrupt the available short circuit current, uh, and do a good job. It's dependable and reliable type of uh, uh, replacement that we're talking about here. And that's what this illustration is trying to illustrate to the user of the NEC. Now this illustration deals with surge protection. In the coordinates with NEC 409.70. And basically the purpose of the change is just to verify that this surge protection could be uh, integral with the control panel or adjacent. And that's basically all this illustration is illustrating. And remember, go to Article 242 for more information on search protection. And to identify the different types of search protection, go to Article 100 and review the types and then review search protection as identified in Article 100. And basically, it's what this illustration is trying to illustrate to the user of the NEC.